All right, guys, let's hop right into air pollution. Okay, so we've talked about Earth's atmosphere, Earth's air, weather and climate. Now we're going to talk about um, air pollution. And obviously, if you talk about air pollution, you've got to be discussing human activity. Okay, so um, air pollution definition here talks about it consists of gas, liquid, or solid. Um, and a lot of these things are already present in the atmosphere, regardless of humans or not. But what's happening is through a lot of our action, we're creating enough of them to raise levels um, that are considered to be harmful, okay? harmful to humans and other organisms or materials. Um, so as you'll see with some of these primary pollutants, and we'll talk about primary versus secondary, um, carbon dioxide, you hear about a lot, carbon monoxide, these are odorless, colorless gases, and we will talk about the greenhouse effect and CO2 traps heat, okay? Uh, it's not the strongest greenhouse effect, but the reason you hear so much about it is because we create a lot of it, because we burn fossil fuels. Um, you have oxides, okay? These oxides, again, are really related to autos in industry, okay? So you can see here burning coal, automobiles, industry, industry, excuse me. Um, and this right here, these oxides create acid rain. We'll talk a little bit more in depth about acid rain as well. And then methane. Okay, methane is extremely efficient at trapping heat. Okay, um, methane traps about 20 times more heat than carbon dioxide. Okay? And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about where um, this methane creation um, is coming from as far as humans, okay? Because again, this would be uh, created re regardless of human activity or not. Um, and then this last one, particulate matter, you know, dust, ash, salt particles, pollen, stuff like that would naturally be in the atmosphere. Um, but we'll talk about particulate matter and stuff like this coming from, it could be coal mines, it could be uh, factories, it could be automobiles creating particulate matter. And we'll discuss this picture right here in more depth, what that particulate does and why it's considered a pollutant. Okay, so those are the primary pollutants. Okay, so make sure you understand primary. They're harmful chemicals that are entered directly into the atmosphere. Okay, so there's no chemical reaction, reaction occurring in the atmosphere for it to be a primary pollutant. Okay, when these primary pollutants do react chemically okay, in the atmosphere, they become secondary pollutants. Okay? So harmful pollutants produced in the atmosphere from a chemical reaction involving primary air pollutants, chemical reaction. So make sure you understand that primary pollutants only become secondary pollutants when they undergo a chemical reaction. Sorry, guys. Okay, sorry about that. So, um, chemical reaction involving primary pollutants has to occur for it to become a secondary pollutant. We will talk about these two things a little more in depth later. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, you have oxides that are released, and that's what this is showing you here. Oxides being released, they react in the atmosphere. Okay? And again, we'll get into more of the, the detail of this later. But there's a chemical reaction of the oxides in the atmosphere creating acid rain. Um, ozone, in the stratosphere, it's good. If we're talking about air pollution in ozone, we're talking about this right here, smog, okay? So what happens is you have a reaction between some oxides and hydrocarbons that create smog, okay, or pollution, and that's considered the bad ozone. And again, we'll get into more of that um, later on in this slide. So make sure you understand the difference between secondary and primary, primary, these are pollutants that are emitted. So like down here, these would be your primary pollutants. They show it coming directly from a vehicle. It doesn't become a secondary pollutant until in the atmosphere, the pollutants from that exhaust undergo a chemical reaction. Okay. Um, a heat inversion okay, is dealing a little bit more with um, air quality, but it does have to do with pollution because it is, it's a, it's a byproduct of um, air pollution, okay? Um, and a heat inversion is where you have warm air on top of cooler air, okay? Sometimes it's referred to as a temperature inversion. Um, but when this occurs, okay, 
And what makes it really, really bad is due to the pollution that we create. Okay? So first thing you have to understand is this right here, the standard atmosphere. Okay? So typically you have cooler air sitting above warmer air. We already kind of talked about how warmer air wants to rise, cooler air wants to sink. So if you can imagine, this creates a circulation, okay? a movement of air. But what happens with a heat inversion, okay, what you get is you get a kind of a, a bottling or a, a, like a lid, a you know, trapping effect on the atmosphere, you know, low in the atmosphere. So it talks about here, warm air above cooler air lasts at the lid, suppressing vertical mixing. Vertical mixing is what we're discussing here. So um, sometimes you guys, if you have a fireplace, um, you may, may have heard of maybe like no burn days. Okay. When we have these heat inversions, um, what they do is they don't allow anybody to burn anything. Okay. And the whole point of that is not because they don't want you to have a fire or there's something wrong with the fire. It's all of the particulate matter, okay, the ash and all that stuff that's released. If you have a heat inversion, the more of the stuff that's coming from these homes, as you can see here, okay, since you don't have vertical mixing, it literally just kind of stays right below here. Okay. And sometimes these can be a day, sometimes they can last more than one day, and what you can get is you can get kind of an accumulation. Okay. And they become bad in places like Phoenix and LA where you can see kind of in these valleys. Okay. Um, so, and it talks about here, mountains can increase the strength of valley inversions, really heat rally inversions, simply heat inversion. Um, but um, heat inversions are, you know, if they occur and, you know, there, there wasn't, you know, in a big metropolitan area, it wouldn't be a big deal. The reason they become a big deal is because of all the pollution we create, and in turn, that pollution gets trapped. Okay, so heat inversion is where you have a flip-flop, okay, or a switch of the standard atmosphere. And if you have warm above cool, that vertical mixing or air mixing and shifting, warmer and cooler air mixing through the atmosphere, um, it creates a bottling effect or a lid trapping fluids. And so that's why you have no burn days if you see on the signs of the freeway. Ozone. Okay. Ozone, what it is, is very simple. Okay. It is O3. Okay. Um, it's highly reactive gas, three oxygen models, um, natural, man-made. Okay. Natural is good, as you can see here in the stratosphere. Naturally occurring ozone is great. Okay, because what that does is it shields us from excessive amounts of ultraviolet light okay, or radiation. So that helps to protect us. Where it's bad is in the troposphere. That's when we consider it smog. So the bad ozone is being discussed here. Okay? And you can see it also here. Bad, good. Bad, good. Okay? Um, bad ozone, troposphere. Good ozone stratosphere. Okay. Um, this is just showing you the real basics of how it forms. Okay. So oxygen models being split. Okay. If you split an oxygen molecule, those free oxygen atoms can combine to form ozone molecules. You guys will watch a video and do some work on ozone depletion, which we'll talk about later. Sorry. All right. Good, I don't teach math. All right, so um, from this slide, understand what ozone is, O3, okay? That you have good naturally occurring ozone in the stratosphere, protects us from ultraviolet light. In the troposphere, you have bad ozone, which is created from things like exhaust, okay, or burning of fossil fuels. And when it's in the troposphere, it's bad, okay? That's what I want you to understand for this slide. This one right here, <clears throat> excuse me, ozone depletion. Okay, there's a whole lot of writing here, okay, for possible human causes. Um, what I want you guys really what it boils down to is this picture right here, okay? And you need to understand the basics of what's going on, okay? So you have CFCs. CFCs are chlorofluorocarbons, okay? So they come from, excuse me, things like freon propellants, uh, foam products, several different uh, 
use is for these. But what happens is if they're released into the atmosphere, okay, there's one particular atom in that molecule that really um, is detrimental to the, the ozone layer. Okay, so you have CFCs they're showing you here, they're released okay, by us. Okay. Number two, it talks about how CFCs rise into the atmosphere. That's number two. Number three is showing you the interaction between chlorine and O3. What chlorine um, atoms do is they actually um, destroy ozone by taking the, the, the oxygen atom, one of the oxygen atoms from the ozone molecule, okay, which then just turns it into oxygen. Okay, so what they're showing you with three and four is three, they're showing you the chlorine destroying the ozone, and then four showing you that there's less ozone. Okay, so if you had two ozone molecules, now you have one. Okay, um, so it depletes the ozone layer, and then you'll see you have one line, meaning very little of the solar radiation gets through, versus here, you have three. So the significance of this, that this part of the picture is you deplete the ozone layer, more solar radiation is entering, which can have a negative impact. Skin cancer, damage to the eyes, disruptive immune system. Um, and it can have um, effects not just on humans, but also on other organisms. Okay, so you definitely need to know, if you can, under, if you can remember this basic little description here, you'll do fine on the test, okay? But you have to understand the basics of ozone depletion, okay? and really how we create it. Uh, possible natural causes, uh, volcanoes, okay, they'll release chlorine. Um, there's also chlorine that comes from, um, excuse me, the chlorine from this sources, sorry, um, from these a lot of times they talk about how it is, um, what is it at here, dissolved in water, okay. Um, CFCs, the difference between that and CFCs, they're not broken down, okay, they're not dissolved by water. So this is a possible cause, okay, it does release some chlorine, um, but a lot of it can be naturally dissolved in water and washed out, uh, the atmosphere and rain. Um, so there are, there are some natural causes as, all, as well. Um, so it's not just 100% humans that are, uh, um, depleting the ozone layer, their ozone molecules. Some of this depletion can occur naturally uh, from sources like volcanoes. Okay, and I think on the test, I don't even think I have a question about this. Okay, um, but if you know, if I had to boil it down to you know what exactly from here, understand that the, the possible natural source of chlorine in regards to ozone depletion would be volcanoes. All right, uh, greenhouse effect. You may have learned about the greenhouse effect. I hope you did in integrated science. Um, the greenhouse effect, the natural greenhouse effect, as you can see here, is good. Okay, we need it. If we did not have the naturally occurring greenhouse effect, extremely hot during the day, extremely cold at night. Okay, um, and the big thing about the the cold at night, okay, and what the greenhouse effect does is it helps to trap some heat. So it's not like it's you know. 200 degrees during the day and then minus 200 degrees at night. Okay, the temperature cools, but the reason it doesn't have, there's not a gigantic swing in temperatures is because some of that solar radiation that was received during the day when we were facing the sun is actually trapped in the atmosphere, which is good. Okay, when it becomes bad is when you have this here, the human enhanced greenhouse effect. Okay, um, up here it's just showing kind of a breakdown of the gases, greatest to least. You don't have to remember, you know, the order of these, okay? Water vapor should make sense why it's the most abundant, and that's because 75% of Earth is covered by water, so tons of eva water evaporation. Um, then carbon dioxide, methane, so on and so forth, okay? Um, this picture, sorry about that. Um, this picture here, what I want you guys to see is a couple things, okay? You're going to see all these squiggly, squiggly arrows, <clears throat> And you'll notice that this one and this one are the same. I'm going to change the color of the pin here. Okay. So, sorry. 
there, there we go. So the solar radiation coming from the sun here and the solar radiation coming from the sun here. The arrows are exactly the same. Okay, the width. Um, so regardless, if we're talking about either of these, we get the same amount of solar radiation. What changes are these two arrows here and here. Okay, the other arrows that stay the same is re-radiated. So what this is talking about is that all that solar radiation that makes it through the atmosphere and is absorbed by Earth's surface, some of that is re-radiated, sent back out into the atmosphere. And this little line here is showing you that some of it is trapped. Versus here, you'll notice a lot of it is trapped. Here, a lot escapes back out into space. Here, very little escapes back out into space. So I'm going to erase all this. All right. So the significance of this, guys, is when you increase, and you can see it here. Oh, that's terrible, huh? <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. Let me erase everything. What you can see here, I got this kind of like pointer now thing, is the CO2, CH4, so your oxides, your methane, your carbon dioxide, what they're trying to signify with this image over here is one, they're much larger, the font, and also it's a lot more red, reddish orange color throughout the entire atmosphere versus here, okay, you've got more blue and you got all of the font really small. The significance of this is here, human enhanced greenhouse effect, we have created an excessive amount of greenhouse gases and greenhouse gases trap heat. So if you have more of them, more heat will be re-radiated back and trapped in the atmosphere than you see here. Here, the line, little squiggly line, is much smaller, representing less re-emitted heat. Here, more re-emitted heat. So less is escaping out of our atmosphere. Here, more is escaping. So what you have here is you have a flip-flop. So here is the natural greenhouse effect. And if you were to look at these two arrows right here, okay, these are the two that flop, okay, they flip flop here. Okay, you have more radiation leaving here, less radiation leaving here, hence this will create a rise in temperatures. That's the human enhanced greenhouse effect. This over here, don't worry so much. Let's talk about short wave and, and uh, long wave. Don't worry about it. Okay, this is the one you really need to know. All right, so that's the greenhouse effect. And understand the natural greenhouse effect is good. The human enhanced greenhouse effect is not. The human enhanced greenhouse effect is what will increase temperatures. And they increase temperatures because you have more greenhouse gases trapping more heat. All right. Acid rain. Um, acid rain, some people think it's like uh, rain that if you were walking around and it's raining on you, you'd like feel it, you know, burning your skin or something like that. It's not. Um, rain itself is a little slightly acidic. Okay, so acid rain um, brings that pH down even further and makes it more acidic. Okay, and over time, if you have those types of conditions, um, you have precipitation that is acidic. Um, over, you know, it could be a forest, it could be um, a lake, a river. If you have that over a long period of time, you can change the overall pH of the environment, which can um, make it stressful for a lot of organisms to survive. So what acid rain is anything that's unusually acidic, meaning it has a low pH. Don't worry about the hydrogen ion things. That's just um, all that like pH really means, okay? Um, and yes, it has harmful effects, plants, aquatic animals, infrastructure. Infrastructure, what they're talking about, like statues, um, some things that are made out of stone, things like that can sometimes be um, affected by acid rain. Now, as far as the creation of it, um, it talks about emissions of carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxide, so oxides. Okay, so that's what they're showing you here. So this part right here. If you're talking about the steps of acid rain formation, it's the oxides released by the burning of fossil fuels primarily. Okay, so 
those oxides then, as you can see right here, okay, so oxides are released, travel into the atmosphere. In the atmosphere, they react with water, creating acid rain. Okay, and there's all kinds of different precipitation that can come down. So again, acid rain, you're lowering the pH. The, uh, the creation of it is due to the burning of fossil fuels released into the atmosphere. Oxides are released in the atmosphere. They react with water, creating acid rain. Okay? Um, this right here says, how can the air pollution that creates acid rain produce water pollution? Well, as you can see right here in this picture, okay, on land you can create the pollutant goes up in the atmosphere, it travels, it comes back down in another spot, creating water pollution. All right, so that's acid rain. Um, particulate matter. Okay, this one you don't hear about much. All it is are your solid particles, dust, pollen, ash, soot, metals, all types of different things. Okay, some would be here and be in the atmosphere regardless of us. Other things we put in the atmosphere. Um, but they are solids, okay, so... And in particular, very small solids. Okay, so I'll talk about that size using this image. So you have inhalable fine particles and inhalable coarse particles. And it all has to do with the size of them. Okay, so the inhalable fine particles, 2.5 microns in diameter or smaller. Okay, they're emitted from forest fires, power plants, industry, automobiles. Um, we will talk about in the next slide, you'll see a picture of why these, both of these, okay, these fine particles, these fine pieces of particulate matter um, are dangerous for our health. But this right here, this is not a Slim Jim, okay, and it looks like the Slim Jim or salami or something. This is actually human hair. So this human hair um, is going to be used as your reference to show you just how small these particles are. Okay, so inhalable fine particle is extremely small. You have this right here, this bigger um, like sphere right here, excuse me, is 10 microns. The little tiny spheres around it are 2.5. So when we talk about inhalable fine particles, you're talking about these little tiny spheres and if you see them next to a single human hair, you really get an idea of how small they are. Even these right here, okay, the inhalable coarse, okay, larger than 2.5 and smaller than 10 microns. So all of these types of fine particles that are in the atmosphere are both significantly smaller than a human hair. And that's what we'll talk about, what makes that dangerous. Okay, why is that a bad thing? Um, how can that affect our health? Okay, and this picture kind of shows you the health impacts. So it says particles 10 microns or less are capable of bypassing the body's natural defenses in the nose and throat. Okay, so if you've ever, I don't know, worked in the yard or been outside when it's dusty um, and then you go blow your nose, sometimes you'll notice there's, you know, there's brown or black or there's dirt or whatever in there. Um, that's what the defenses are, the mucus in your throat and, all, and those other things in your mouth. Those are all defense mechanisms, and okay? they help to trap things and keep them from going into your lungs. If you're exposed to these really, really small particles, the, the uh, fine and the coarse inhalable particles, you can get um, severe problems, especially over long periods of time, because what happens is these particles, um, if you haven't, and, you know, again, if you haven't learned like maybe anything about anatomy, you have these like little air sacs in your lungs that are very, very small. And these, this particulate matter can actually get in there um, and get lodged in there. And so, you know, black, uh, black coal disease, or excuse me, black lung disease, <laughs> black coal, coal is black. Black lung disease um, was something that coal miners used to get a lot. Okay, it's not totally gone, but they've gotten much better about it. But these coal miners would go down and they'd be inhaling all of this um, fine particulate matter for decades and decades as they worked down there. And what was happening was their lungs were getting filled with coal. Okay, so literally what would happen is they would get things like this, as you can see here. A okay, long-term exposure um, can create things like reduced lung function, 
chronic bronchitis, and a lot of times it led to death. Um, short term could be, you know, acute bronchitis, asthma attacks. Um, so it has both a long term and a short term. But the, the thing I want you guys to understand is things that are 10 microns or smaller. So these things right here, they bypass our natural defenses and they get into our lungs. Okay? And over long periods of time, it can be very, very detrimental to your health. Okay? So those are all the different types of air pollutants. So we have particulate matter. Um, we have an acid rain, greenhouse effect, um, ozone depletion, ozone and its basic formation, um, a heat inversion, secondary pollutants, primary pollutants. Okay, so you're going to have a lot of work and a few videos and things to work on this. If you have questions, definitely let me know. All right, see you guys.